All right, what's going on, everyone? For the first time in a long time, Russia kicked off offensive operations in northern Ukraine. So we're going to talk about what we know so far, looking at sources from the Russian and Ukrainian side, what Russia might be trying to accomplish with this maneuver and what it could mean going forward. Now, this is very much a developing situation, so what I'm going to talk about here is the information I have at this point, which this video is being recorded at noon central on Friday, May 10th, 2024. Now, starting with a map update to give you an idea of the areas we're going to be talking about here, starting zoomed out a little bit, uh, all of Ukraine, most of the focus in the last few months, really more than a year, has been down here in the south and the eastern portion of Ukraine. In the last few weeks, much of the focus has been uh, in Oshiterne, here west of Avdivka, and then a little further north, looking at Chasivyar, just west of Bakhmut. We're going to zoom out a little bit to give you an idea. Today, we're talking about this northern area up here between Belgorod and Kharkiv. There's two key areas that have been highlighted here using Deep State Map. If you go back to yesterday, you're going to see two areas here that have started to, according to Deep State, are now contested. So go back and forth here again. The areas that have turned to gray, two notable areas here moving from under Ukrainian control up against the border with Russia to contested. And that's notable. We're going to get into some Russian accounts at this point where they too are not yet saying that they necessarily have control over any of this territory. But these are the two areas that we're going to be looking at today. Again, zooming out a little bit north of Kharkiv, and you'll see that most of this fighting to the north and the northeast hasn't really happened since the fall of 2022. So this is notable. So diving into what we know at this point, starting with official sources, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense said, quote, during the day, the enemy carried out airstrikes in the Vovshank direction using aerial guided bombs. As night came on, Russian invaders increased fire pressure on the front line of our defense with the support of artillery. At about 5 a.m., the enemy attempted to break through our defensive lines under the cover of armored vehicles. The Ministry of Defense assures that the enemy's attacks have been repelled, and reserve units of the armed forces have been sent to this area of the border. Fighting of varying intensity continues. That last piece there, fighting of varying intensity continues, is a consistent theme across the board. It looks like both sides are kind of mirroring that and being very hesitant to put out any concrete information about the direction this battle has so far gone. I have not yet seen, again, as of this recording, any official statements from the Russian Ministry of Defense. I was just checking their page right before I, I hit record. Still nothing officially coming from Russia, but of course we do have multiple other sources inside of Russia we'll be able to leverage. Sticking with another Ukrainian kind of point of view, if you will, here for a couple of these, this is reporting from Deep State Map. So that same mapping service, they have some reporters. This was posted on their Telegram channel. They say Russia is trying to enter and gain a foothold in a number of settlements along the border. The main Russian forces are currently infantry with the support of a small amount of equipment. The available resources that the enemy has used at this moment will not be enough for a deep advance. Currently, the situation is such that Russians are destabilizing the border areas, but it is not known how many main forces they are ready to use for this maneuver. What they're getting at is the amount of forces that have so far been deployed and committed to this fight a relatively small number. We'll get into specific numbers here momentarily, but they're not clear yet, still not clear yet, how many of these might be held in reserve that could push forward at any given point. Then shifting over to a couple of Russian sources here. Well, this first one's kind of a mix. It's a Russian telegram channel called Mill Info Live, and they're quoting a Ukrainian journalist named Yuri Butasov. Uh, they say Butasov complains about the ineffective defense of the Ukrainian armed forces in the area, despite awareness of a future Russian offensive. We're going to quote an article here in a minute where it came out yesterday, where Ukrainian forces in Kharkiv were saying, hey, the Russians are probably going to attack here sometime in the near future. They say it's interesting that according to his information, the attacking forces amounted to only four to five infantry battalions, which indicates the involvement of the Russian armed forces of only a limited contingent to probe the defense. The main forces did not really enter the battle and will most likely be deployed where the enemy can be pushed back the most. Of course, that's information we don't have, don't have at this point. If you think back to the early days of the war, there's a lot of speculation that more Russian forces would be coming. And these smaller elements were really just probing to try to find a weakness, but that big hammer blow never really came. Have to keep that in mind. At the same time, it's not out of the ordinary for any military force to push a smaller element forward like this to kind of probe the defenses, a recon by fire, movement to contact in a way, find the best path forward, and then commit a larger number of forces. That is 
possible, completely up in the air right now as this battle continues to play out. A Russian reporter, Andrei Rodenko, said, For those of you who think that the Kharkiv operation will be quick, I'm ready to disappoint you. It won't. In this direction, a very hard war work will fall on the soldiers of the Russian army. Our military will have to go through dozens of settlements, then blockade the city of Kharkov itself, if, of course, the goal is to liberate the Kharkov region, and it is 100% worth it. The task is to prevent even the possibility of striking Belgorod or Kursk. We're going to come back to that. Our president also spoke about this in his speech, the idea of a certain gray zone. But since the Americans have installed systems capable of delivering strikes over more than 300 kilometers, the Kharkov region must be liberated in accordance with this. This is the only way we can secure our cities. The operation will last months, maybe more, but the task will be completed 100%. There's a couple different ways to view what's happening right now in this uh, border area between Russia and Ukraine. One of them is this consideration of a buffer zone, trying to push back Ukrainian forces so they can no longer strike anything inside of Russian territory. The problem with that is it's not a matter of 10, 20, 30, even 50 kilometers, right? Ukraine has significant long-range drone capabilities right now to where, realistically, Russia would have to take all of Ukraine to, to shut that threat down entirely. Um, you know, some of these artillery systems, rocket systems, shorter range drones, sure, you can make a 10, 20, 30 kilometer buffer zone, and it would reduce the likelihood of those strikes happening in this case in Belgorod. But again, Ukraine does have significant drone capabilities to where a buffer zone isn't really going to solve that problem. The more likely reason has to do with just the process in which Russia is going to be able to pull Ukrainian forces away from other locations on the battlefield. And we'll get to that here in a moment. Another Russian source here, two majors, says the Russian army began offensive operations on a wide front of up to 36 kilometers, occupying a number of settlements. The degree of control of each of them is not reliably known. There are oncoming battles and artillery strikes. Again, the theme from both sides right now, Ukraine tends to say that Russia is not in control of any villages. They're hesitant to say that they have lost control of any of those areas. Russia's not really claiming control quite yet. Now, there wasn't an official buffer zone on that border. If you look at the map, uh, it, it looked like the Ukrainian lines went right up against the Russian lines. In practice, there was likely a little bit of dead space there. Again, the trench lines were not five meters apart, right? There was some degree of gap there at baseline. It's possible what we've seen play out is that Russia has occupied that gray zone, if you will, which is a move into Ukrainian territory and moves the lines forward, certainly. Uh, but that could be why there's a little bit of confusion as to whether or not certain settlements and villages have necessarily changed control. Two Majors continues by saying the Russian armed forces entered some settlements in the Kharkov region a few days ago into empty positions without a fight. Again, the idea here of a possible gray zone already existing there, just the nature of this fight. They say the enemy left them, saw and filmed our fighters, but apparently did not report to the higher command. The reason for pulling the Ukrainian armed forces to its rear was most likely the strikes of the FAB missiles and artillery. Such strikes have been intensified for more than two weeks before the offensive. The Russian army also had bridges disrupting the enemy's logistics. The Supreme Commander said to create a buffer zone and to take care of our soldiers, which means the offensive will be slow but inevitable, bringing artillery within firing distance of Kharkov and depriving the enemy of the last remnants of calm in this industrial city is a completely feasible task, in our opinion. One thing can be said for sure, the Russian army has begun offensive operations in the Kharkov direction. That tends to be more where I fall on what the purpose of this move is, where he says uh, bringing artillery within firing distance of Kharkov. If they're going to try to take Kharkiv tried to take that city center. They have to bring artillery closer. Two majors hit on that. Uh, I'm going to circle back to that here in a minute, talking big picture about what all this means. So I mentioned a second ago that this attack wasn't entirely unexpected. And to cite that, we actually have an article that appeared in The Economist yesterday talking about this possibility. They interviewed the commander of the Kraken Regiment who said that they expect the enemy to attack in Kharkiv again in mid-May, but reckons they will fail to get near the city. They say he was interviewed outside of a ruined school building in the east of town uh, where much of the 2022 battles took place. And he said the defense there is much stronger now. It has three lines of fortifications and a full brigade to stop the Russians. He said they can move a few kilometers into the province, but I don't think they can get as far as 10 kilometers. That's kind of in line with what we've seen, but it's also very, very early in this fight. We're, you know, maybe not even 12 hours into this operation, so it's very hard to look at how far Russia has advanced and say that it is a success or a failure or to judge it to these metrics. But it's interesting that just yesterday, which means this interview would have been given at least maybe a week ago, maybe a little earlier, 
uh, Ukrainian commanders were calling this out, saying, hey, it looks an awful lot like Russia's going to try to kick something off here in Kharkiv, and they did. This is not a, a minor event. It looks like Russia put serious resources behind this operation. All right, so in talking about what Russia might be trying to accomplish here and why this is significant, I think it's best to pull up a map of Ukraine. So my opinion is that Russia is likely kicking off this offensive around Kharkiv to try to further spread out the Ukrainian defenders, especially as a new batch of U.S. aid is set to arrive in country. So what I'm getting at here is if you pull up, looking at this map, when the war started, 2022, the full-scale invasion in 2022, there was fighting raging from north all the way around the east to the south, right? The line of contact was 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 significant. It still is, and there still are attacks, artillery strikes, drone attacks, small arms fire all across the front, all day, every day. But there are certain areas that are hotter than others, right? There's certain areas that have our attention. Most notably recently, we've been talking a lot about Oshiterne, just west of Avdivka. Of course, the Russians have been advancing there for a couple weeks and or months now. Then we've got a little bit north, Chasiv Yar with Bakhmut, right? These are the areas that are front and center when talking about Russia advancing against Ukrainian positions. So in turn, as new trainees come in, as new recruits come in, as reinforcements come in and new equipment comes in, a couple of the key areas they're going to be sent are Chasiv Yar and Oshiterne. Makes sense, right? That's where the fighting is. Russia just opened up a new area that has to be in consideration. It has to be in consideration because it's not too awful long before they will bring Kharkiv under direct artillery fire, indirect artillery fire, directly in range of indirect artillery assets, right? And that's a big concern. It's a major population center. So it's one more location that Ukraine is going to have to spread out their resources that likely plays to Russia's advantage. So I wouldn't expect Russian forces to be able to take Kharkiv anytime soon. Again, it's a significant population center. It doesn't look like they've committed anywhere near the number of troops that would be necessary to take a city of that size. So that's probably not in the cards right now. What we're probably seeing, and this is something that uh, was talked about in a recent War on the Rocks podcast with Michael Kaufman, is that they're probably trying to move forward towards Kharkiv to get within artillery range so they can hammer this city. That is how Russia has taken cities and towns throughout this war. Right? They get within artillery range, they bring it under just incessant bombardment for weeks, months, maybe even longer, and then eventually over time are able to push infantry forward and take over that terrain. Right now, Kharkiv is around 27 kilometers from the nearest Russian position. Yes, Russia has multiple munitions that can range 27 kilometers, but if you're talking about trying to just have a city constantly under bombardment, even the eastern, northern, most outskirts, you really want to be inside of 20 kilometers. Because remember, artillery pieces are not going to be at the forward line of contact, right? There's not going to be Russian artillery pieces right here, 10 meters behind the front, trying to range something at the max range of their weapon system. They're going to be set back a little bit to protect from counter-battery fire and Ukrainian drones. So you add in a couple more kilometers on top of that, again, 20-ish inside of 20 kilometers, and all of a sudden Russia is going to be able to really hammer Kharkiv with some of their artillery systems. Of course, to do that, they would have to push forward just a little bit. That's why you might be seeing right now a few infantry battalions instead of multiple brigades. Again, entirely possible Russia is going to commit those brigades at a later date, waiting to see an opening, but that's probably what is happening right now. Just little by little, taking little chunks of land as they move so they can bring Kharkiv under Russian artillery control. Now, another concern that I can see popping up here is that it's very easy to look at how progress has been all across the front, again, heading back to maybe Chasivyar, and say, man, it's been slow. These forces aren't moving fast. This is the nature of the war, and it is. Every one of these fights for so long now, we haven't seen these rapid maneuver advances where a line breaks down and either side breaks through for a significant gain. In fact, the last time we really saw that was up here in Kharkiv when this big green area here, you see all this? That was held by Russia. And Ukraine broke through those lines in the fall of 2022, and the, line, the front collapsed. That was the last time we really saw a major advance like that. That's not what the war has been for a long time now. The challenge is it could always go back to that. And it's kind of the same thing that could trigger it, right? This is the kind of war, this attritional style war, where things are happening very, very slowly in terms of movement on the ground, but they can happen slowly and then fast in the blink of an eye, right? So the slow chipping away, in this case at the Ukrainian lines, eventually could get to the point where the lines are no longer able to hold and you start to see them collapse to a degree. That's not a prediction. I have no insight. Insight is just the idea that, you know, little movement can't be ignored because little movement can turn 
into bigger movement. But again, for now, this is the area to keep an eye on up here northeast of Kharkiv. We've got two pockets that Russia has begun to push into. Uh, but again, very developing situation. I'll try to keep an eye on this over the next couple of days and update you all as more information comes out. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if you're interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack, which is linked in the description below. Substack is like a mix between a newsletter and a website. We've also got podcasts, audio articles, quite a bit there. Uh, just this week, we put out articles talking about security situation in India, uh, AI being used to detect threats and, and uh, invasions and attacks before they happen, and then the resurgence of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Again, all of that is linked in the description below if interested. But thanks for watching. And I'll see y'all next time.